How's everyone doing today? Good. Good. Fantastic. Good. Pretty good. Okay. Did you do your readings? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. I tell my students in Edinburgh all the time, reading is fundamental. Okay, Tommy, I think we have uh, pretty much everyone here. Uh, so you can feel free to start uh, whenever you're ready. Fantastic. Do I have the share screen option again? We're going to make you the host in one second. All right. Oh, it already works. Yeah. Is it okay to start, Elijah, or? Yeah, you can start whenever you're ready. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. All right, can everyone see my screen? All right. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Uh, so today's lecture is on social dominance theory. Uh, social dominance theory is the largest and most prevalent um, empirical account of intersectional um, studies in the academy. Uh, the reason you don't hear about it is because it's based on facts, empiricism, economics, et cetera. Uh, so a lot of the things that we read in liberal arts uh, focuses more on the experiential and the anecdotal accounts of discrimination. Uh, social dominance theory is a method that was developed by Jim Sedanius uh, and several of his colleagues to actually test the way that interactions happen between different categories. And what I mean by that is social dominance theory thinks of intersectionality is the interaction between two variables. So if you say something like race and gender interact or intersect, they're gonna ask you, if I test the interaction of those categories empirically, what are the kinds of things that I'll find? Does that make sense? Yes? All right. So social dominance theory is a, is a system or theory that is based on group-based social hierarchy. So what that means is that social dominance theory begins with the basic observation that all human societies tend to be structured as systems of group-based social hierarchy. This means for Sedanius that at the very minimum, this hierarchical social structure consists of one or a small number of dominant and hegemonic groups at the top or one or a number of subordinate groups at the bottom. So among other things, the dominant group is characterized by its possession of a disproportionately large share of positive social value. And for, for Sedanius and social dominance theorists, positive social value means material and symbolic things that people strive for. So if I look at a group-based hierarchy where I say I have a group that's dominant and a group that are oppressed, the dominant group should have things like political authority and power, good and plentiful food, good homes, great health care, wealth, and high social status. So while the dominant group possesses a disproportionately large share of positive social value, subordinate groups possess a disproportionately large share of negative social value, including such things as low power and social status, high risk and low status occupations, 
So that would be extremely dangerous jobs that poor, pay very little, relatively poor health care. So you'd be able to, you, if you look at a society and you had, say group A has a life expectancy of 78, group B in the same society has a life expectancy of 62. That means that the subordinate group has a lower health status and that would correlate to the subordination, poor food, modest or miserable homes, and severe negative sanctions like prison and death sentences. Now, what's, I wanna go back to this for one second. What, you have to adjust your thinking. Uh, the way that you're taught to understand the world, especially in high school, uh, is going to be based on what you take liberal politics or social justice ideas to be. That's fine and good. But when you start getting through uh, to college, and to graduate school, and then heavily into the professorship, sometimes those things don't work out based on the ideology that you're taught. So when you actually start testing things and looking at very specific interactions between groups of people, the notions you have of race discrimination, gender discrimination, et cetera, may not hold true in all cases. So subordinate, um, I'm sorry, not subordinate, we're not there yet. Social dominance theory utilizes a trimorphic structure group-based hierarchy. So what that means is that the group-based structures of hierarchy are divided into three sets. The first is an age system. In this age system, adults and middle-aged people have disproportionate social power over children and younger adults. And I want you to make a note um, somewhere about this. This age system will actually be talked about again when we do the Black Male Studies lecture, because the first definitions of patriarchy that were offered by Max Weber uh, in the 1940s, uh, 30s and 40s, was actually defining patriarchy as a system of older men that actually ruled over younger men and women. So age system and kinship hierarchies are major um, component of how we think of black male studies. So just note that in the back of your mind. The second thing is a sex system. A uh, sex system is basically what you understand as patriarchy. So I think that through, by the end of the presentation, that definition will change a little bit. Uh, it's a system where males have disproportionate social and political power compared to females. And lastly, and this is what most of my research concentrates on, is the arbitrary set system, which are socially constructed and highly salient groups based on characteristics such as clan, ethnicity, estate, nation, race, caste, social class, religious sex, regional grouping, or any other socially relevant group distinction that the human imagination is capable of constructing. So when you think of the arbitrary set system, think of the socially constructed group. Uh, the example that I consistently use with this in my classes is uh, if you could think back to 9-11, uh, when there was a terrorist attack uh, on America or an alleged terrorist attack, uh, on America. Before that period of time, Muslims were generally thought of as a religion. After that period of time, Muslims became highly racialized and, and thought of as an antagonistic group. Uh, that's, an that's an example of an arbitrary set construction where a specific group was constructed to be a threat and outside of the bounds of civility to the dominant group, which is uh, majority white, or most white Americans. So we have to make a mental adjustment here because this is gonna change the way that you actually think about the dynamics of oppression uh, between group-based social hierarchies and individual-based social hierarchies. By the term group-based social hierarchy, Sidanius means something quite distinct from an individual-based social hierarchy. An individual-based social hierarchy, individuals might enjoy power, prestige, or wealth by virtue of their own highly valued individual characteristics, such as athletic or leadership ability, high intelligence, artistic, political, scientific talent or achievement, but in group-based hierarchies is referring to social power, prestige, and privilege that an individual possesses by virtue of his or her ascribed membership in a particularly socially constructed group, such as a race, religion, clan, tribe, lineage, linguistic, or ethnic group, or social class. This is extremely important. The way that I think that most people understand privilege and power uh, often focuses on the relation on, on a micro level analysis. When I say micro level, I mean individual to individual. Um, they're interested in how white individual A compares to black individual B and black individual C in a specific context. So if you're in a classroom setting, which usually indicates people of um, some social economic mobility, uh, you'll then say, well, control that for that environment. These two individuals are black, that individual's white, they have white privilege. A group-based analysis would say something like um, individual A 
is white. Whites have more access to education, so we can expect that whites will outnumber blacks in most college settings. Because of that, white teachers have expressed certain biases, certain universities, or create certain climates that are antagonistic towards black membership or the black group, right? So a group-based analysis is going to say that what we call individual privilege is going to be a direct correlation or a link to the overarching status that the group has in the society. And that's gonna be exercised in very specific institutions in very specific contexts um, on, on a case-by-case -case basis because the structure of the society is built so that different contexts express that power differently. So arbitrary set systems um, are actually some of the most violent or how some of the most lethal forms of violence. So this is important to understand. Uh, social dominance theorists are arguing that arbitrary set systems, the groups that are socially constructed as outside of of a dominant group or race or ethnicity. Um, those groups are the ones that are gonna be subject to the most lethal violence. That's going to include things like the Holocaust, uh, ethnic conflicts, uh, various forms of genocide, um, various forms of brutality. The, those are not going to happen as much within the other levels, right? So as Sedadia says, arbitrary set system is by far associated with the greatest degrees of violence, brutality, and oppression. While age and gender systems are certainly no strangers to brutal forms of social control, and the operative word there is social control, right? The brutality associated with arbitrary set systems very often far exceeds that of the other two systems in terms of intensity and scope. So accounting for numerous events of genocide at the global conflict, Rwanda, the Holocaust, the Romanian genocide, et cetera, uh, Sedanians and Prado conclude that arbitrary set discrimination um, that the levels, uh, arbitrary descent discrimination levels of barbarism and bloodlust is rarely, if ever, observed within age and gender systems of social stratification. So another way of asking that question would be, when I, when I raised the question last time when we were discussing Foucault, has there ever been a genocide of like all old people are, are all women, right? So has there ever been a case where only old people and women were, were, were victims of genocide? And of course, the answer to that is no, because of the kinship relationships that different in-groups have to old people and to women. The difference is, is that there is not a kinship relationship with ethnic or racial groups that are outside of the dominant group. So that's why it's able to house the most extreme lethal forms of violence, like genocides, war, and ethnic conflict. Now, one of the most controversial theses, I don't know it's not really controversial because it's actually the most empirically proven, one of the most surprising, I guess, um, theses of social dominance theory uh, is its argument about outgroup men. So arbitrary set discrimination uh, actually targets outgroup men more than other members of groups. Since there's overwhelming evidence that intergroup aggression is primarily a male enterprise, what Sedanius means by that is that most wars are conducted by men, most defenses against uh, imposing or uh, conquering groups are, are, are launched by men, um, the idea of safety and security of a society is really given to men, right? That's what he means when he says intergroup aggression is primarily a male enterprise. Um, there's also reason to expect that arbitrary set aggression is primarily directed at outgroup males rather than outgroup females. So if we regard normal forms of intergroup discrimination as mild forms of intergroup aggression, then Sedania suggests that there's a reason to suspect that it'll be primarily males rather than females who are targets of this arbitrary set discrimination. He labels this thesis the subordinate male target hypothesis. So put in context of the uh, trimorphic system, Sedanus and Rosemary Venegas say this. Uh, the subordinate male target hypothesis basically argues that in essence and in general, we suggest that women from both arbitrary set in-groups and out-groups will be the subject to gender discrimination and the dynamics of patriarchy. However, it is primarily outgroup males rather than outgroup females who will be the primary targets of arbitrary set discrimination. While arbitrary set outgroup females will certainly suffer from the effects of arbitrary set discrimination, largely as a result of their close associations with arbitrary set outgroup males in the forms of husbands, sons, fathers, brothers, and lovers, we should expect that arbitrary set outgroup females will not be the primary target of arbitrary set discrimination. The reasoning behind this expectation 
is that arbitrary set discrimination is primarily a form of intrasexual competition perpetuated by males and directed against males. As such, arbitrary set discrimination can be viewed as a form of low-level warfare directed at outgroup males. Social dominance theorists label this the subordinate male target hypothesis. Now, it's important to clarify, because I know when I'm talking to, to students often, the question is like, well, what does this mean that women are not oppressed? It is not what the empirical work actually finds. The subordinate male target hypothesis does not imply the absence of discrimination against women, for such discrimination clearly occurs and is part of the gender system of group-based social hierarchy. So women within a patriarchal, capitalistic Western society are discriminated against primarily on patriarchy or sex-based uh, power structures. Rather, what they're suggesting is that it's everything else being equal, subordinate males rather than subordinate females are primary objects of arbitrary set discrimination. So remember the distinction there is arbitrary set discrimination be your more direct forms of, of discrimination like segregation, apartheid, and your more lethal forms of discrimination, such as genocide, police killings, prison, industrial complex, et cetera, right? So the argument that social dominance theorists are making, especially under their counter gender prejudice, is that the patriarchal systems differ in kind than arbitrary set systems. This is very, very important. Right? And this is going to, and, I, and the reason I put the benevolent sexism work in there for you is so that you could actually understand that when you're talking about sexism or patriarchy, you're not talking about the same thing as racism, right? So it's very important to understand that these are differences in kind, um, not simply the analog of each other. So Sedanius uh, argues that the foci of patriarchal and arbitrary sit systems differ with respect to intent, right? Immensely important. So patriarchal oppression differs in intent from what we would call racism or arbitrary set discrimination. The patriarchal system is primarily a project of paternalism and control of the sexual and social prerogatives of women rather than a project of misogyny, hostility, and aggression, right? So when we get to Glick and Fisk, you see they substantiate this claim either farther. In contrast, Social dominance theory argues that arbitrary set hierarchy is primarily a project of usurpation, social predation, and as elucidated by the, the theory of gender prejudice, male versus male aggression. So to summarize, one important implication of these distinctions between hierarchies based on sex and those based on arbitrary set is that we must avoid thinking that sexism is simply a form of racism that just happens to be directed against women. Rather, it is a distinctly different system of a hierarchy designed to serve distinctly different purposes. And one of the main purposes um, is that within a sex system, within a system of sexual discrimination, you can still have positive or benevolent views, right, of, of the women in that society. So as Glick and Fisk talk about, and McKinnon talks about uh, it, uh, in the argument about um, racism leading to sexism, or sexism leading to racism, is that you can have extremely positive views of women, deem them needing, needing protection, define your masculinity or patriarchy on that basis, and give your life to protect those women. That does not happen in the arbitrary set system. So the system of racial domination from across the world throughout the 20th and 21st centuries does not include a benevolent system where members of the dominant group, as in mass, have a socialized system to give their life for the betterment of the outgroup, right? That's the argument that Sedanius is making. So subordinate women, right, are affected by arbitrary set discrimination through association with the subordinate target male, or the subordinate male target. So Sedanius is saying, look, nobody's going to argue that subordinate women, that'd be, that'd be black women, other racialized minority women, are not affected by arbitrary set discrimination is merely saying they're not the primary targets of arbitrary set discrimination. So he says, first, the subordinate male target hypothesis is primarily concerned with targeted discrimination and aggression directed against members of an arbitrary set and by virtue of membership in that set. So they argue that a female subordinate and other, uh, an example being an African-American woman might suffer from the indirect effects of arbitrary set discrimination and oppression 
but not the direct effects to the same degree as the male subordinates. And if you look in the uh, article on his theory of gender prejudice, and we'll go through that at the very end of the presentation, you can actually see the, the delineations of police killing, uh, retail, education, social mobility, wage, of why that's the case. Uh, the second point they make is that to the extent that African-American women are dependent upon relatively limited social resources available to black men in their relationship to her as husband, son, father, or other source of social support compared to women from dominant arbitrary sets like white women, these indirect effects of discrimination will make life, uh, daily life considerably more challenging for the average black woman than for the average white woman, right? So this offers some context to why you see black women in general have a lower amount of wealth, household ownership, uh, stability, savings, et cetera, compared to their white female counterpart, even, the, even though when you control for class uh, starting position, uh, salaries and social mobility are basically the same, right? Uh, so that if you read any of the stuff that, um, you know, Chetty and Hendred have done, the recent stuff in economics, uh, they found that black men have larger uh, gaps of, of uh, downward mobility. And what that means is when black men is born in the middle class or the upper classes, he's much more likely to fall out of those two classes to the lower classes in one generation because of discrimination. Whereas a black woman who's, who starts off in the upper class or middle class has a much better chance of staying in one of those two classes, right? So this is the same thing that's being said here. Because black men are constantly pushed out of society, the overall wealth of the black community is going to be better explained through the gap between, of earnings and wealth between black men and white men because the earning potential of social mobility of black women and white women are very similar once you control for class origin. So supported women suffer from sex discrimination, right? So this means, according to Sedanius, that the primary apparatus of female oppression is not going to be arbitrary set, but going to be sexist or patriarchal. So he argues, we're not arguing that women would not perceive high levels of generalized discrimination by, for example, being frequently and severely targeted by sexism, sexual harassment, and abuse. The theory of gender prejudice uh, posits that subordinate women are primarily discriminated against on the basis of their sex, yet face less race-based discrimination than subordinate men. So even when you compare these two groups, and we'll get this to this in a second when we start talking about intersectional visibility, uh, the prediction of uh, a social dominant theory view is that subordinate female discrimination will be less severe, by severe they mean less lethal, um, than the subordinate male target discrimination. So they want to emphasize that the subordinate male target hypothesis inequality does not imply that women from subordinate groups will never face arbitrary sex discrimination. Rather, the argument is that to the extent that females do face such discrimination, the degree of this discrimination will be less severe than that discrimination confronting them. Right now, this has been taken up by intersectionality. As you could imagine, the, the evidence for this um, contradicts the kind of intuitive and culturally socialized view of double jeopardy, uh, which under the liberal frame simply suggests that the more identities or subordinate positions that an individual has or can claim, uh, the more oppressed that person will be. Uh, when we test these things empirically, it just does not work out. So Intersexual Visibility was an article written in 2008 uh, that tries to reinterpret uh, the notion of male, greater male, subordinate male disadvantage as an actual privilege. So let's look at what they say. Uh, Purdy Vons and Richard P. Eibach argue that the oppression of subordinate group men is the product of psychological dispositions that evolved as males competed resources in the human ancestral environment. By contrast, our model, and they're talking about their model of intersexual visibility, views the oppression of subordinate group men as a reflection of the general tendency in androcentric society to view all men, both those of the dominant groups and those of the subordinate groups, as more important than women. It is this marginalization of women in an androcentric society that causes subordinate women to be relatively ignored as direct targets of oppression compared to subordinate men. Now, I think this restatement is important for two reasons. The first is, notice that given the overwhelming empirical evidence, they, don't do, they do not introduce a theory that tries to refute the claim that in patriarchal Western societies uh, with capitalist surplus, 
that racialized men are the most, most oppressed group. What they try to do is reinterpret the mechanisms of that oppression. By saying, where, so where social dominance theory says, look, the subordinate male target is going to be eliminated because he's viewed as a threat to the society, right? They're gonna say, yes, but that's because the, in a patriarchal society, they value, they value men more than women. And it becomes an issue of recognition. But when we get to the Black Lives Matter uh, discussion, you're going to see how this actually plays out in real time. So the argument, you, you can't argue, for instance, that Black men or, or Brown men or Indigenous men are not killed at 20 times the rate of their female counterpart. So you, instead of making that argument, because it's just a fact, you say, oh, well, they're being recognized more. So because the whole issue of intersectional visibility is an issue of recognition, right? Well, since Black women are uh, migrant women or other uh, subordinate groups of women, right? Gay women, trans women are not being recognized. That recognition is equal to male privilege. And that comes about because of this argument, right? That was introduced in 2008. That says that the material effects and consequences of killing don't matter. It's only who's recognized as more valuable within that society. And because they think that killing whole groups of men is based on the importance that men have, intersectionality theorists and intersectional feminists then by claim that, well, even though men are dying at a higher rate, they're dying because the society values them more than the women, even though the women are safe, right? So what's conceded by Purdy Mons and Ibach, however, is that the double jeopardy thesis or hypothesis um, has been largely disproven, right? That one of the reasons you have to reinterpret the findings of social dominance theory and the subordinate male target hypothesis is because the double jeopardy hypothesis, which said that the uh, experience of multiple forms are uh, meeting, uh, being a part of two marginal groups leads to greater oppression, um, is just not empirically true. So they actually say that not only should minority men bear the brunt of ethnic discrimination, the subordinate male target hypothesis also suggests that ethnic minority men should be worse off overall than ethnic minority women, despite the fact that ethnic minority women also suffer from oppression based on gender. Self-report studies actually support this claim. And I'm happy to go through that article with you more when we get to the black male studies topic. So the theory of gender prejudice uh, tries to account for and answer uh, part of the claim of intersectional invisibility. The best way to think of intersectional invisibility is this. Um, social dominance theory will say, Patriarchal societies target outgroup men uh, because those outgroup men are a threat to the society. Uh, under the social dominance frame, that's viewed as oppression. Under intersectional visibility, they will say, well, that account of events is exactly true, but we don't think that the men in a patriarchal society are oppressed. We think that the men being killed are privileged. So the privilege of being recognized as a man in an androcentric society leads to greater death. And the theory of gender prejudice is saying, well, look, this is a ridiculous claim because when we look at all the evidence, the men are not just targeted for lethal violence, they're more materially oppressed than the women in the society, right? So this is why they say that theory of gender prejudice causes that one cannot fully comprehend the dynamics and nature of arbitrary set discrimination and oppression like racism, sectarianism, nationalism, tribalism, unless one apprehends arbitrary set oppression as a deeply gendered phenomenon. So there are three hypotheses implied within this foundational assertion. The first is consistent with the invariance hypothesis, or the proponents of empirical evidence seems to support the idea that human males are more supportive of group-based dominance and inequality than human-based females. Second, and in line with the male warrior hypothesis, males are also found to be vastly overrepresented among the organizers and perpetuators of both interpersonal and intergroup aggression and oppression. Third, as articulated in subordinate male targets um, hypothesis inequality, males are not only the disproportionate perpetrators of interpersonal intergroup violence and acts of domination, but also the primary targets of this discrimination, violence, and acts of subjugation. So this leads us to a different account of why social dominance theory actually believes that subordinate group women are not targeted the same way as men. And one of the reasons for that is because of their understanding of patriarchy 
as largely a benevolent occurrence. So in social dominance theory, the view is that, look, patriarchy, rather than being misogynistic, right, because you don't, it doesn't sanction women the same way that it sanctions racial groups. It's not an arbitrary set discrimination. Um, there has to be more components involved rather than not. And one of the examples of the, one of those components is called benevolent sex, sexism. So benevolent sexism is the idea, or a paternalistic idea, that because women are weaker in other groups, are, are weaker, the women of the in-group are weaker and vulnerable to other out-group people, both male and female, that they need protection. And Glick and Fisk on page 111 suggest that benevolent sexism may function serve functions similar to the belief in the white man's burden, allowing men to maintain a positive self-image as protectors and providers who are willing to sacrifice their own needs to care for the women in their lives. And what's fascinating about this is that there's uh, lots of evidence that shows that white women um, actually choose mates based on their race of sexism or benevolent sexism. So white women actually make mate selection based on how sexist their partner is are specifically the ability of their partner or their white male partner um, to protect them from other groups of people. So there's an interaction effect between gender um, and femininity and the selection of male partners um, for benevolent sexist ideas and sex. So we have to understand here that this is not saying that there is no misogyny, right? Nobody's making those kind of reductionistic arguments. Uh, what's being said in the empirical literature is that whereas sexism is generally thought of only as misogyny, um, that's incorrect because the overarching dynamic of uh, patriarchy is paternalistic. So you don't see women just being slaughtered uh, across the society in mass by group, right? You may see interpersonal violence, you may see uh, higher rates of interpersonal uh, conflict and homicide in some cases, but even those kind of conflicts generally pale in comparison to the rates in minority communities. So they make this argument that patriarchy and gender differentiation create and reinforce hostile sexism because dominant groups seek to justify their privileges through ideologies of their superiority and through exaggeration of perceived differences with other groups. In addition, we suggest that sexual reproduction promotes hostile sexism because men often resent women's perceived ability to use sexual attractiveness to gain power over them. At the same time, men's dependence on women due to sexual reproduction and role differentiation fosters benevolent sexism, an ideology that counterbalances sexist hostility with a paternalistic protectiveness towards women as a weaker but essential group. So men's recognition of their reliance on women to bear and know through children, to provide domestic labor, and to fulfill sexual and intimacy needs makes women a valuable resource. Thus, even though benevolent sexism presumes women's inferiority is subjectively positive from the perspective of the sexist perceiver, characterizing at least some women as wonderful, pure creatures whose love is required to make a man whole. Notice, this is suggesting that there is an interaction and dynamic between women and men in white culture that gives rise to both hostile elements and to benevolent um, sexist or paternalistic elements. That can be best illustrated um, within, this, within the factor structure of the ability sexism inventory. So you see at the top, there is hostile sexism, which is what we think of as misogyny. Uh, but there's also benevolent sexism, which is what we think of when we say, well, women need protection, right? Um, that there are men and women, and both men and women are needed for the thriving of races and families, right? And for heterosexual intimacy. So the suggestion that Glick and Fisk are making is that while no one can deny that there are some uh, violent or hostile elements of sexism within uh, patriarchal society, specifically amongst the white racial groups, uh, this hostile sexism, however, is not the overarching factor because white people need men and women to reproduce. And that's the way that social hierarchy and positive group-based uh, capital is actually accumulated within the society. Said differently, if you believe in a notion of anti-blackness and racial oppression, then you have to accept at least at some level that, that racial oppression has been created 
by the benevolent sexism that's operating within the white culture that allows white people to constantly reproduce themselves, for white men to protect white women from outgroup men, and for a complementary gender differentiation where white families benefit and accumulate wealth um, in the household and for the group as a whole in interests against black people. And notice how this cuts against the traditional understanding of intersectionality. Intersectionality, um, as Laura she taught, says, oh, well, sexism, racism, all these things are dynamics within the society. Well, yeah, but how do white people keep having families, keep reproducing and having babies and keep accumulating wealth if there wasn't some sort of cultural or systemic understanding that there is a benefit within the paternalistic structure and the, and the pair, the dyad of white men and women compared to other groups, right? So it's, it's looking for a functional explanation of why racial discrimination keeps happening, why there's wealth differences between blacks and whites and the role that sexism and gender play in creating that differentiation. So the last piece that I gave you uh, was from McConnell. And McConnell argues, and this is a fascinating study. I, I, I teach it um, every semester um, you know, at Edinburgh. And it shows that benevolent sexism actually correlates to the subordinate male target hypothesis or, or modern racism. So what this study found was that protective paternalism, right, the idea that white women are weaker, because right, you're, you're studying this for whites. So that the idea that white women are weaker and need protection from outgroup members um, actually increases the threat construction of subordinate group males. That there's a relationship between the need to protect white women and the construction and perception of racialized men as fundamentally as fundamental danger, right? So there, and there's, in this study, they found that protective paternalism was correlated with measures of subtle anti-black bias, but only for whites. Specifically, white participants who endorsed protective paternalism more strongly also scored higher on modern racism. And we're more likely to believe that African-American police shootings, uh, shooting victim Michael Brown was responsible for his own death and showed less support for Black Lives Matter. Participants' gender did not moderate these effects, right? So that means that white men and white women, both who have benevolent sexist views, so white women who believe that they're vulnerable to Black men or brown men or Muslim men, and white men who believe that white women are vulnerable, show less empathy towards other uh, racial-based justice movements. And this is a huge finding because it shows that the white people who claim themselves to be racially progressive and gender progressive are lying, that, they, that there is a tension between suggesting that you want uh, white women to be safe in a society and who the group as a whole identifies as threats to white women uh, in that very same society. Right? So they do say one of the limitations that although the data is correlational, um, it does provide initial evidence of the potentially insidious relationship between protective paternalism and racism. So this means that one of the effects of benevolent sexism is that it increases uh, white male racial anonymity against outgroup men. Um, the results of that study are consistent with the logic of masculine protection in which good men have a sacred duty to protect their women from bad men. So male participants who read that violent crimes such as murder, rape, and assault were increased across the country showed an increase in their endorsement of protective paternalism relative to the control group, suggesting the salience of these evil others motivated their desire to safeguard women. And the reason that this is such a fascinating study is because in this time period that we're in now, where Black people, especially Black men, are being called murderers and rapists, et cetera, that means that the liberal whites, the liberal motivations and the coalitions that you think are fundamentally uh, increasing because people understand a bunch of complex issues is just not the case. That in, in actuality, the evidence overwhelmingly shows that people who believe that, uh, that white women are fragile or endangered by racial groups of men are going to retreat into more conservative sexist attitudes and that white women will choose those men right, for their, for their masculine identity, because in an environment where racialized groups and racialized males are, are fighting to become more free and more access to civil society, they need male protection, right? So really quickly, I wanted to just illustrate some of the basic claims um, for, for the uh, theory of gender prejudice. Uh, I want to go through some of the charts, uh, and then we can open it up for discussion. 
Uh, the empirical support for the supporting male target hypothesis has been noted by uh, various, you know, empirical fields, sociology, economics, etc. Um, but what's most interesting about it is just the uh, gender comparisons between the groups. So this, for example, is an argument about the uh, percentages of black men and women uh, experience unfair treatment because of race as a function of their domain. So this is basically an argument of like, how do, if you ask people, have they had experienced racial discrimination in the last 30 days, usually within a month, uh, this is their, these are their responses. As you can see here, uh, overwhelmingly, and this is a study that's been reproduced several times over the last 20 years, um, overwhelmingly, uh, racialized men, specifically black men, uh, report higher levels of discrimination um, in various things. So with, in terms of public transportation, interactions with the police at work while dining out, while shopping. Um, black men have experienced higher levels of racial discrimination within the society. Um, what's interesting, what's interesting about this too is that there was recently a study that came out about the levels of racial discrimination or perceived discrimination amongst students here at the University of Edinburgh. And the same finding was reproduced that in terms of stereotypes, negative interactions, violent interactions and verbal abuse, uh, racialized men reported at higher levels, about five to 10% higher levels of experiencing that even in a place like Scotland. So Scotland generally thinks of itself as being progressive, but even with the small minority, a, le a, a, a less amount of racial animosity because there's not an antagonism between the groups in the same way, across the board, racialized men uh, report higher levels of this, of this kind of uh, issue. Uh, you see the same thing with weekly earnings. And this is fascinating because uh, I want to make a, a small point about this. So the, the line at the top is white men. And this very much reproduces a very recent study um, by a guy who won a Nobel Prize uh, in economics. Uh, but what this is what this shows. When people try to compare wages and earnings, what they try to do is they try to make it a hierarchy and they list it from top to bottom. That's fine generally except when you're trying to look at the dynamics of how groups interrelate with each other. So you can see, for instance, <clears throat> that black women and white women up to 2010 um, are very close in terms of their, their average weekly earnings. So if you look at the data from up to 2020, like we have access to that data, they're pretty much the same. And what this means is, is that assuming everything is equal, meaning same job, same education, same class, et cetera, Black women and white women find parity, right, in terms of what they can earn, right? But we know that white women are better off than black women because more white women start in our upper class and keep on this upward trajectory, right? Look at the relationship between black men and white men. You see how wide that gap is? That's, that's the function of downward mobility. So you see how black men are constantly approaching down towards white women in 2010 in terms of their earnings. That's what we mean when we talk about uh, the lack of social mobility or downward mobility. Dr. Curry, which, which slide is that? Because we don't, I don't see that on our screen. What are you, should, I'm sharing my screen, so it should be right with in front of you. Figure three. This oh. one says benevolent sexism increases white male envy. Yeah, you're, you're sharing the PowerPoint, and I think now you're referring to a uh, different okay. screen yeah. that you didn't share. Okay, let's see. We changed that. I just didn't, I just, I, I just, I was fascinated by that. And then I looked and was like, that's not the thing. All right, one sec. Can you see that now? Yes, that's, that. yes, that's not what was on the screen before. Okay, excellent, excellent, thanks. No, thank you. Right. Can you go back to where you were talking? Cause, yeah, cause yeah, that... I'm going to right now. All right, can you see that? Yes. All right, so this is, these Could are average weekly earnings. Dr. This Curry, is what I meant. Can you re-explain that, please? Yeah, yeah. So this is what I meant when I said that we have to look at um, mobility over a course of a time period. So you can see how from 1970 up to around 2000, that black women and white women are roughly the same. The new data that was published in the New York Times um, actually shows into 2020, this gap is closed. That black women and white women, when you control, and I'm trying to be very clear about the limitation of this, when you control for all things being the same, Education and class origin, meaning if, they, if you're comparing white women that started the middle class to black women that started the middle class with similar education of, of parents, you will find this result, right? When you do that, 
it's basically the same. When you look at black men and white men in that, you see that there's a huge income gap. And you see a downward mobility where black men cannot maintain the same kind of worth or wage that white men do. And they're constantly pushed down to the same earnings of women, if not less, because they, they also disproportionately uh, suffer from unemployment, incarceration, et cetera. So those factors combined is, what, is what's meant by downward mobility. Now, the reason that this is important is because what it shows is that within a racialized system, right, arbitrary set discrimination does not confer male privilege. Because if you're looking at the comparison group, which are white men who have male privilege, black men do not have male privilege, and in many ways go under black women and white women in that society. Because the economic sustenance of the group in terms of labor participation, you know, how many people are actually in the economy, the unemployment, how many people fall out of the economy, the incarceration, how many people are moved out of the society, all have lasting economic effects, right? This is the rate of return for each year of college education, right? And you can see there that black people um, especially don't get much return compared to whites. But look at the difference between black men and white men. In 1960, 1980, right? Very, very small, right? So that means that black men don't get to benefit, right? From, from, the, from uh, additional years of college the same way that other groups do. Right? And this becomes, this becomes a problem. So it means that in the society, and this is consistent with the arguments that you're getting coming from the subordinate male target hypothesis, right? In the society, black men are not getting as much per uh, additional year of education as other groups. You can also see this in terms of wage differentials, right? Increased hourly wage per year, increase in post-education. You see how close the women are compared to the men. And you see here, even that white women make more than black men, right? Social dominance theorists are saying, look, this is a function of arbitrary set discrimination that maintains a clear distance between white men and black males within a society. And the last one that we'll talk about this study, uh, this is adjusted income. You see the same thing in adjusted income, right? In terms of black and white. But I wanted to show you the, the uh, slide on, yes, a criminal justice, because I think this is something that people really don't understand. Uh, even though, and I'll, be, I'll give a lecture of this in black male studies, and we'll go into detail about some of these ratios. Uh, but when you look at the imprisonment ratio, Right, you know, people. I don't. I actually don't know what people do because they just randomly select data. Um, two things matter in terms of when you're talking about imprisonment. Usually, the rates of imprisonment <clears throat> per hundred thousand in specific age groups, right? Because you have to know who's being taken out of society and what age bracket, like eighteen to twenty-four, twenty-five to thirty-four, etc., and the total number incarcerated. So, if you look at this. You can see, this is 2011, this is old data. The numbers have decreased um, for both blacks and, um, and whites, but it's increased for white women. But if you're looking at this data, you can see that in terms of blacks, black and white females, um, the ratio is basically 2.8. But look at the differential for, for white men and black men. Right? And this is what the kind of evidence that Sedanius and other social dominance theorists are using to substantiate the claim that there is a more specific and direct form of oppression being directed at outgroup men than women. Because that, and this is what they mean when they say that nobody's saying that women are not uh, discriminated against, but that level of discrimination um, is not comparable to the level of discrimination you're seeing uh, with the outgroup male group. And this study will get a lot uh, into a lot more when we talk about police killing in week three. But this, but the plant, Goplin, and Kuntzman study is fascinating because what this study says is that when you take college educated white people, right? And you give them targets. So this is, this is an implicit bias study about who do they shoot first, okay? Look at the data, right? So unarmed black men are shot more 
than every other group, whether they're armed or unarmed, right? This is the percentage of errors. So that means that unarmed black men are shot more than armed black women and armed white women. I, um, how is that possible, All right? And then it says that armed black men, right, they don't make errors, right? It's, you know where you're gonna go. So, so how? So think about that. Think about that. Like how? How is it that we exist in a system? where um, the, the very idea of being a male target seems to operate to the contrary of like every idea we have when we look at evidence, you know? And this is, this is what's so interesting about these kinds of theories is that once we start testing for the interaction effects that are undergirding what we take to be our popular liberal politics, they don't work out the same way, which is why we constantly see the ineffectiveness of, our, of our, our moral reformism, if you will, and our political activism. Because systems and social bank hierarchies operate to reproduce very fixed economic and political goals. And if you don't take that into consideration, you could talk all day about which group you think is oppressed, but it doesn't change the way the system reproduces and distributes actual goods. Does that point make sense to everybody? Right? And that's what social dominance theory is trying to get at. How do you test the actual interaction uh, between the mechanisms that we think sustains our liberal politics. So I think, um, I think that's almost an hour, so let's uh, open it up for questions. Uh, yeah, I had a question. Do you think that um, schools, like in America today, since they are like heavily segregated and um, there are schools that are either like predominantly like one race or predominantly another race, um, that schools that are like predominantly white, for example, um, they're more likely to like target black men or have that stereotype of black men when they like become police officers. So that would account for the disparity or like, what do you think is the reason why like yeah. black men get shot more than like armed black women, for example, because those results are yeah. like, fascinating. I know the plant, the plant study is fascinating. Um, when we get to the police studies lecture, I'm going to give you a, a lot of data but nobody knows a fundamental cause, right? Um, black male studies thinks of it primarily on the issue of kinship. There's a need to remove these people from society to have access to other female bodies. Uh, and there's substantial evidence um, regarding that, but it's a question of whether or not you put, put police shootings in that same realm, right? Because, you know, incarceration makes sense. Genocide makes sense. You know, police killings kill roughly 290 black men a year, nine to 15 black women. You know, is it the same kind of genocidal impulse? You know, you can, you can make the argument for it, but you know, it's not absolute, right? I think there was this idea of patriarchy versus, uh, I think, benevolent sexism. I didn't exactly get that idea. Is it possible that it could be re-explained a little bit? Yes. So the idea isn't that the two are opposed. It's saying that within patriarchal societies, there are two forms of sexism. One is hostile, which is what we think of as misogyny. The other is benevolent and paternalistic. Social dominance theory argues the, the kind of discrimination that women experience in a patriarchal society is predominantly benevolent because white men benefit from having them as partners and keeping them safe against other groups to, uh, to propagate their race. Thank you. No problem. I have a question. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um. So, like, why do you think men like fetishize like, like lesbians so much when they also like really crave that like like females love as you were talking about before? Now that was part of the patriarchy. I don't but, know like, that they fetishize lesbians. Like, what group are you talking about? Like, like, what do you mean? Like, are you, because you, you said men, so are you talking about black men, Muslim men, like? You cut out. Like, it's fine. Like, what, what, what group of men fetishize lesbian? Well, it's, it's just, okay, we, it's fine. I have a different question. Okay. Yeah, go with other questions. Um, so would, like, intimate partner violence be more categorized under hostile 
um, like hostile sexism, yes. or could that also be a product of like wanting to protect by like? No, usually across the board, I think that most people categorize intimate partner violence and homicide as a form of misogynistic violence. Um, the problem is, is that you have a lot of data that shows that the rates the rates of violence don't segregate the way that people want them to. So like women are not overwhelmingly the only victims of intimate partner violence in the United States. So feminists have had a hard time making a misogyny causal in that, in that way. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Did you freeze? Yeah, I heard she froze. Hello? I think I lost her. All right, next question. All right, so my question is like, isn't the social dominance theory like kind of problematic and trivializing because it assumes that like most women want men that like, who are in social power and who have wealth? For white people, no, that's like a fact. Dang. No, I mean, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Like you can you can feel a certain way about it, but what's the counterfact? How do white people accumulate wealth and power if white women didn't choose mates with wealth and power? I don't know. I'm just thinking like from a certain standpoint, it can seem messed up for like just well, maybe from the point of like society today, I think it like that theory I'm, kind of I'm willing to I'm willing to entertain that. I'm asking you, what is your alternative explanation? So if you think it's messed up. How do white people, why do white people have $45,000 per household compared to blacks who have six? Uh, well, men off, off, uh, some, mostly uh, gets the most amount of money in lo those white households. Yeah, but women, women make 77 cents per dollar. So that means that if a white person, a white man and a white woman marry, they're making $1.77. White men right. live literally five to 10 years less than white women. And white women inherit all that. So then why... Why are, how are white women doing that? Uh, I just think it's weird to say like all uh, like white women are marrying into wealth. Why are they choose how do they choose mates? Love. Just simple. Now that's simplistic. So your so your view okay, so look, let me so here's my question to you. So your argument is that white women for the last two centuries have just coincidentally overwhelmingly falling in love with only white men in a multicultural society like America. Mm, yeah, I'm, don't make a lot of sense, do it? No, that doesn't, but I understand. But, no, but, but people, this is what I'm talking about, right? Like, notice the idea is like, well, something about the evidence makes me feel bad, <laughs> right? So I want to say something about the evidence. But if you just think about it, like how else can we explain white people choosing white people in all these scenarios? White people have been next to black people for almost 300 years in this country. And they just happen to over, overwhelmingly marry other white people? Well, it could be based on the fact of race, not money. But race is a code for money in a segregationist system. So if I'm a slave or I'm segregated and I'm poor, I'm not gonna choose the, the black person that ain't got nothing. I'm gonna choose the white man who, who could provide for me and, and, and increase my social status and protect me from the black man I'm trying to segregate and keep out of my schools. Why do you think white women were at the front of this anti-integration uh, anti movement? All right. So black women don't marry for social power and wealth. They absolutely do, but they have less mates to choose from. So that means that they have different ways of articulating uh, positive partnerships versus white women. So a lot of the data, for example, shows that because black women are more educated, more socially mobile, that marrying black men actually costs them and it decreases the wealth of households. But black people have different logics by which they interact with each other because black men have been pushing out of the economy for years. We know this in our own communities. Generally, women are more educated. All right. Okay. So it's more of a majority framing then because it's saying like, not all women want to marry. No, no. Woman. I mean, no, it's a sociological argument. I'm, all the data I show you talks about like dynamics. The majority, there is a dominant view in the culture. That doesn't mean all. Many of the group make these kinds of decisions, which is why the, the group is able to sustain and reproduce racial wealth and prosperity over other groups. 
Okay. So um, then, what does that mean for like, so if you said that like the reason why white people are so successful and have so much intergenerational wealth is because white women choose to marry successful white men, does that mean, does that then mean that black women are to blame for black people's lack of wealth? Since they no, I just no, no. I just showed you all the data showing that the reason that black people don't have wealth is because black men keep getting pushed under the earning power of white men. It's nobody's. It's not black men or women's fault. Is the way the system is set up, right? Like no matter how much money black women make, you can't sustain a whole society because there's no one to to inherit the money. You see what I'm saying? So that means that even take take black women, let's say they make an average of ninety thousand dollars, and black men make forty five or sixty. Even when you put that together, and if black men die, you don't have a way to reproduce that. Which is why, if you have a family that's middle class and black, and you have a son, the forms of discrimination in society won't let him push up; it'll push him down. So that means that you'll never be able to accumulate the same kind of wealth that white people do, right? There's actually a really good lecture by this by um by Chetty at Harvard where he explains this exact same dynamic. Wait, and if there so was not gender discrimination, the, way, the rates of income and wealth would equalize over like three or four generations. But because of this kind of downward mobility of black men, that's why you see the kind of wealth gaps in the black community. Why do like white women uphold racist structures? It benefits them. Same way white people uphold racism. It makes them richer than everybody else. So it's like they're married to white men or, and then white men benefit from it so they benefit from it too or absolutely absolutely like this is what this is what i meant when i said that you have to start looking at group-based hierarchies if you if you go individual you'll say well look i'm a white well, i'm a white feminist who would never marry a white man and perpetuate patriarchy well that's nice but what are your other white sisters doing they're voting for trump and having white babies so that means that the reproduction of wealth based on the group doesn't change based on one individual person's right activism politics etc so we can have arguments about politics all day, but social Darwinist theory is interesting in how are groups acting and what effect that happens through, throughout the society in general. Um, what is social dominance theory and like, and the theory of gender, um, gendered prejudice have to explain about like the fetishization of black women by white men? Uh, they don't cover that because they're interested in material oppression. Uh, the arguments about that in terms of fetishization, I mean, I guess you're assuming like rape, sexual abuse, negative sexual stereotypes. Uh, you know, those things are often covered in history. We talk about in black male studies, they're just doing a different system. So based on what you said, um, could you, could it be said that a black woman, like there's some value to be found in like interracial relationships, like a black woman could improve her qualities of life by marrying a white man, or on yeah. the flip side, like a white woman is doing herself a disservice by marrying a black man? Yeah, that's exactly what black feminists argue. Yeah. Sheesh. But see, this is, but here's the point, right? So do you see, you see the argument you just made? Yeah. This is this is the this is why black male study scholars say that black men don't have privilege. Because the argument being made about why black women should marry white men is because white men are actually the patriarchs of the society. And if you marry a black man, you don't have the same social mobility that you get from marrying a white man. If black men had the same privilege, if they were actual patriarchs, then we should see a steady rise. But when you look at all the studies, it's called associative mating, which means that women usually want to choose mates that are their level or higher. So y'all have all, you, I'm sure y'all got friends that are girls, girlfriends, da da da. You know how girls, have, women have these lists, right? Yeah, don't cover up, you know, it's cause I'm probably talking about you, Ms. Jennings, right? Y'all got these lists about how tall he needs to be, right? About how much money he needs to make, X, Y, and Z. That's because women choose mates on the idea of what they can deliver for the sanctity of the household. That's just socialized in many different societies. But when you have a system of downward mobility and racial oppression, it becomes much more difficult for you to find racial minority men or ethnic minority men in that society that can meet those criteria. Because those criteria of a hegemonic male are embodied in the dominant group male, not the subordinate group male. And that's why you have all these arguments that's circulating around social media about why black women should start dating outside the race. Because it's more economically beneficial. 
I had a question regarding like the differences between like the patriarchal system and the arbitrary set system. Yes, uh, sir. You said that they differ in intent. I was kind of confused by that. Patriarchies don't try to kill all women. So if it differs in intent and like social dominance theories based off like looking at like empirical studies, how can we like measure intent? Is they're going to look at it in terms of interaction effect. So like what? at the end of that that um, theory of gender prejudice article, he literally says what we talk about, what we're interested in in terms of the intersectional intent or motivation is the interaction effect. It's going to say, look, if we look through all the history and see race and gender, gender interact, are people slaughtering white women in society? No. Do white women have the lowest life expectancy? No. Are white women some of the most educated people? Yeah. Okay, so in that system, what do you think patriarchy is doing? Because these are patriarchal systems. What do you think the motivation of that oppression is? Is it to slaughter them? No. No. Now, if you look at the demographics of black men or brown men, what do you find? Slaughtering. Exactly. When you look at Muslim men, what do you find? The same, uh, similar forms of lethal violence. That's it. It's, it's literally that simple. He's not trying to make a complicated or controversial claim, merely an empirical claim and trying to figure out why it keeps reproducing itself in the society. Makes sense. All right. Hey. Um, other so, question. Oh, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask about like how queer people would factor into the subordinate male um, like hypothesis or like mm -hmm. uh, just these um, th what we've been saying. So so far, I think what we've been saying is that like white men try to get white women, and therefore they see like black men as a threat. Um, yep. Have there been like in studies done with like non-straight people? Yeah. So we'll talk about that when we get to intersectional visibility, um, because it talks about prototypicality and subordinate structures. Uh, and it finds basically the same thing, that lesbian women, the, the prototypical aspect is maleness, right? So gay men are going to be attacked more than uh, lesbian women. Uh, the subordinate structure doesn't move very much for that, either in some, uh, social dominance theory or intersexual visibility. Uh, how does the theory account for, uh, like, the like white saviorism? <laughs> Benevolence? Uh, yeah, like, probably like just virtue signaling. Okay, so it's there's like no theory doesn't that like actually happening. It's all just like people. Okay. Yeah, because it studies political. Like it, you would have to translate that. They do studies on political ideology, right? So they're going to talk about liberal versus conservative points of view, right? But it that it makes claims that even liberal forms of political ideology, while not as aggressive um, as some conservative or hierarchical models, um, still don't overturn group based hierarchies, right? So. I mean, that's how the, a social dominance theorist is really a social scientist. So you have to kind of translate your liberal arts arguments into what they're actually studying. Okay, thank you. But Can like, so the studies show that like, um, like black women and white women uh, like suffer from like uh, similar uh, discrimination and it's not that much intensified for black women. Is this another form of like benevolent sexism for black women? Well, there's, this is, this is the problem. So the recent data actually done by black feminists trying to deal with this issue is having to go that route. They're having to say that femininity eliminates the arbitrary set discrimination that black women feel compared to black men. So like they're studying like police shootings and uh, incarceration. So the idea is because being black means to be black male, uh, most of the racist stereotypes and violence are directed towards men. So being black female makes you invisible and kind of pulls you out of the range or capacity of racial violence, which is how they explain different disparities in lethal violence and discrimination. Okay, so uh, how does this relate to like the double jeopardy theory that's in the reading? So the double, so this is, it's showing that contrary to the double jeopardy thesis, um, it's not empirically true. That it varies based on association with arbitrary set discrimination of the association that black women have with uh, ethnic or subordinate group men, rather than being simply a function of gender. Okay. Does so, if you, so if, you go, so if you marry a black man, you're going to have more association with arbitrary set discrimination than if you're a black woman that's either single or marry a white man. Um, does oppression of like non-binary people fall in arbitrary set discrimination or sex discrimination? That's a great question. I don't know. They have not done any studies on that. 
Um, so I was kind of confused with the study talking about how benevolent sexism correlates with modern, like uh, modern racism. If black women aren't like, or other from the out group aren't recognized as a dangerous male counterpart, does that mean that that these out groups women can have access to like this paternalism that comes from like this modern racism? And if not, yeah. like, how, oh, okay. So, but, but but you have to see you have to be careful. Yes, insofar as you're comparing them to the men. No, if you're comparing them to white women. So that's what so I mean. Like when I, levels. yeah, because you have to you have to think contextually, right? So if you if I put a black woman next to a white woman, who's the society going to protect more? The white woman. Absolutely, hands down, no questions asked. So black women are absolutely disadvantaged to their white female counterpart in that regard, right? If I like, if I use the plant study, if I put a black man next to a black woman. And somebody's going to get shot. Who's probably going to get shot? The black man. Right. So that means that in that context, right, the, the paternalism of not reading women as threats works in her benefit. Right. And there's other studies that talk about in terms of soft skills, in terms of jobs, job discrimination, et cetera. But the point, this is what I'm trying to get you all to understand. These are contextual arguments. To, to, to do this, you actually have to, like, know what the hell you're talking about. Right. So when, you, when you're talking about these things, you're not making absolute claims about women having privilege or men having privilege. You're saying that in a specific environment like police killings or economics or job discrimination, these are going to be the effects that you have in the majority of the cases. Uh, I and just, I have a, oh, never mind. You no, you can, no follow up, please. Yeah. yeah. And then I'll go oh, to the next so this, one. Yeah, it's kind of a separate question. I think about what Elizabeth was talking about, how there are in like there are cases where like uh, lesbian relations are fetishized by like straight men. What like specifically? Uh, like I can't say. But how did that take into account of like, like how would you explain that? Like the form of like. There's lots of ways to explain it. Like you wouldn't, you don't need a social dominance model to explain it, right? Like you know, I mean, when you say fetishize, you mean like men, straight men fetishize about female to female sex or. Yeah, or like yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's, I mean, there's lots of different studies about, um, you know, people who are polyamorous, people who like group sex, people, you know, like it could just be a fetish. I don't know if it's, I'd have to look at the comparison because I don't know if it's one group over the other, right? I mean, they're, they're like the sex uh, literature is very, that, very, um, you're cutting out. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now or? But I'll stop video for a second. Uh, I hear you now. Can you repeat that? Okay. Yeah, the sex preference literature is very um, varied. <laughs> so I have people to actually study this stuff. And people have all kinds of fetishes. I don't know which one ranks. I don't know what order they rank in. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's why I was yeah. saying, like, I can't definitively say. If I'm just doing an off the head analysis with, like, psychoanalysis, I could probably say because, you know, men, men generally fetishize about, you know, female sex, like the mystery of it, but the other stuff that American men are into is really nasty, and I don't know where it, it compares. I just, I don't have a ranking, I'm sorry. So then, question. what does yes, that mean for, like, the intercommunal violence that kind of happens between Black people when you talk about the capacity that Black men have, specifically Black cis men, like, mm -hmm. What does the capacity of the black cis man look like in comparison to the capacity of a black trans person? In terms of what violence? Um, yeah, sure, yeah, violence. But you know, I guess I'm always curious. Like, so what do you think? What do you think that relationship is? Well, have you ever I seen the data for for intimate partner violence in America in, in black communities? No, I haven't seen like a specific data chart that I can. Okay, remember. so what? So what do you think it is? Between black cis men and black trans people. Yeah, or black. I guess because I guess the issue is perpetration, right? Yeah. We don't have any data. We we just have lists for for black trans deaths, but like uh -huh. something we have a data set on is like black men and black women versus like same sex couples. What do you think that relationship is? I think that black cis men or black cis people in general have the capacity to be the perpetrators of violence against black trans people. Okay. Like, are all of them perpetrators of violence? Yeah, probably. Really? Wow. I mean, like, 
yeah, black cis people against black trans people or with the social dominance theory claim that like black cis men have no capacity to commit material violence against. No, anybody black. has, it doesn't say that. Like anybody has the ability to commit violence. The question is, hold on, I'll give you, you know, this is why I like data. Give me a second. This is why data is important. Black data matters. Put on this one. All right, here we go. Okay. I was gonna, and the thing was, I was gonna put this in my slide presentation, but I was like, nah, because this question is not gonna come up. But here it goes. I'm working with. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. This point, I just I, got, I have tons of slides. All right, so this is, I guess, what you're trying to talk about, right? Um, no, not really. This is domestic violence. These are cis black people. Okay. Right, so that's the rates of domestic violence. Black men are perpetrators, black women are perpetrators, right? Black men for up to the 90s are, are greater victims. This is what it looks like right now. Right, so this is black women who are victims of intimate partner violence. 12 month prevalence, 1.3, 1.4 million, right? You see, how that's, you see how that's different than white women? White women's numbers are greater, but you see how their percentage is less? 5.7 versus 9.4 in 12 months. Yes, no? Yes. Right. So when, they, when we say that Black women suffer disproportionately from domestic violence, that's what we're talking about. But what do you see with Black men? 12 month prevalence. Do Repeat, black men you, suffer? you were cutting out. Yeah. Can you see the see Black men in 12 month prevalence? Yes. What is their number? Uh, 9.5 and 14.2. Black men? In 12 month prevalence? I don't, okay, I don't think I see it. Yeah, oh, you 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 gave me the confidence interval. Yeah, no, just do the weighted percentage. So it's 11.6 oh, versus 11. five, 6. right. Yeah. Now, but look, this is black women. The weighted percentage is 9.4, right? Mm -hmm. One point, roughly 1.4 million. This is black men, 11.6, roughly 1.4 million, right? This is race in our community. Contact sexual violence, 849,000. Rape, 264,000. This is black men, 130,000 in terms of contact, 232,000 in terms of rape or major penetrative violence. This is women, this is men. So what does that tell you? Black men are disproportionately victims of violence, of sexual right. violence. And here's your perpetrators. What do you see in terms of made to penetrate violence? We well, could do rape and made to penetrate violence, right? Female perpetrators are higher. All right, made to penetrate, but men are, are, are higher in, right, in uh, rape. So given that those are the facts we're working with, how does that what, how would you ask your question? I mean, I don't know. I still don't see like how trans people fit into this. No, we don't have any data on trans people. We don't know. There's only only eight to what was the last, last number? Was it fifteen or something? I got. I had the last the two thousand seven report. I mean, between eight and thirty trans people are killed in a given year. But what what I'm asking you is, what what kind of program or pattern can you recognize with that number? Black men are disproportionately victims to material violence. Right. But, but I want to talk about trans people. I, mm -hmm. I guess what I'm put, this is what I'm pushing you on. I'm not trying to refute you. I'm asking you what claim are you trying to make given what we know? What claim was I trying to make before or after that? Yeah, yeah either one. Well, so let's, say, let's say there's 40 people. Let's say 40 Black trans women are killed per year in the black community. Mm -hmm. How many black people are in the United States? I don't know. 
40, million. Almost 45 million. All right, so the given year out of 44 million, let's half of that, let's say 24 million are adults, right? Let's say, say 12 million are adult men. 30 trans women are killed. So what, what would you, what, what question would you, or what claim would you try to make based on that? Black men, black cis men, um, suffer from material violence more than black trans women. What do you, what, what do you want to talk about perpetration? Let's say that oh, I'm saying. Hold on, Dr. Curry. There's something happening that I, I don't know if you recognize. She's trying to tell you what she want, what you want to hear, but that's not. Yeah, that's not what I'm trying to get you to say. But the question what? that she asked in the beginning about the capacity to commit violence, mm -hmm. she already believes there's certain bodies who are, who are less violent slash more violent than other bodies, and so the conversation you're having is why you believe that capacity question is probably bankrupt based on the data, but the conversation she's having is because of a bunch of preconceived notions that you are now criticizing based on the data. So I don't want you to yeah. miss like the conversation that's happening. Right, right, right. I so what, think here's what I'm asking. Piece of that too though, which is that the current data that we have can't answer that question. So trying to make that data stretch to make another pattern when the data is not set up to analyze trans people at all. Like right. how are we supposed to make that, how are we supposed to make that leap even based on the data that you're showing us now that's not about trans people? Right, that's what I'm saying. Like how. Do, like what statement do you want to say, one? Which seems to be that cis black people, specifically cis black men, commit disproportionate amounts of violence against trans people, right? Could we reframe it to say trans people, black trans people are more vulnerable rather than making it sort of a perpetrator type model? But, but Christiana, if you say more vulnerable, then the question can't be more vulnerable if, if you start looking at the numbers of who dies versus who doesn't die. Right, but there's but not then numbers how for trans people. Account? Right, but then the data doesn't account for trans people, but then also, I guess looking into like the lives of trans people is um, kind of difficult because a trans person can be out and not be out. So I no, guess- Absolutely. It, it does, look, it's not, here's, here's what I was pushing. The claim that you were, that you seem to be making initially was mm -hmm. that, was the claim that I deal with constantly, which is this myth now that trans people, cis, tr are, cis black men are threats to trans women, right? Okay. And, and what I'm trying to ask is, if that's the claim, right. how do we make such a claim, given that there's 12.5 million cis or well, black men in the country, and only of all that group, only 38 trans people or trans women have died? Like, what generalizable claim can we make? I lose you. I don't know. They almost was you. There you go. Because I don't know, it gets kind of like tricky because I also think that like, okay, there, there's 30, 38 trans women that died, but like 38 out of how many black trans women? We don't know. Right. So I feel like it's not right to build a claim off of that until we know, like, I feel like so, it's not, oh. Well, how do you, how do you, okay, how do you, when you say it's not right to build a claim, what do you think we should build a claim on? I don't know. That's that's what so, I was asking. That's saying, what my I'm question saying, was. That's the thing, Sana, is that you're building a, a notion of vulnerability onto a community that you have no reason to build a vulnerability on. Well, I why think, is that true? Yeah, like yeah. I think okay, you can build vulnerability. It's reason. Hold on, hold on. But here's what I'm saying: you can build a vulnerability on any community you want, right? But what I'm saying is, is that I don't know how you develop an explanatory theory about it. Right. So is it the case that we don't know if all the perpetrators that kill trans women are actually straight men? We don't know that. And in the cases where we do, does that mean how many straight men have to do something before it becomes a characteristic of the group? You see what I'm saying? And I guess, and here's, here's why I'm asking that question. Like what happens if somebody says, okay, well, I'm going to build a case on how violent black mothers are to children or to their husbands. We have tons of data on that. And you're like, well, no, I don't think they are. They're like, look, you have the highest rate of perpetration of any racial group in America. So that means that all of you are X, right? Like, is, would we say that's responsible scholarship? 
No. No. So I get what I'm what I'm pushing you on is the assumption behind the claim. Right? Which is what like so if you think that straight or cis black people are threats to trans people, are you saying that that's because you think that cis people oppress and create, you know, ungodly violence against that community? Yes. Okay, what's the evidence for that? They do. Yeah. I think, I think it would, but I do think that reframing it as cis people perhaps is maybe more fair because I do agree with you saying that like we're trying to like fill in that then black yeah, I mean, men are the ones yeah, that are violent, not, but I do think yeah, it's I just don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, all I'm saying is I don't know how we substantiate the claim beyond X person killed Y person and there's 20 people that did that. So we should focus on X, right? We should focus on this dynamic. So if you got 20 million people and 40 people do something, you can then build a theory about what the perspective of that 40 people are? No, not generally. If those 40 people are saying that there's discrimination against trans people and that they're open to violence because people are transphobic, Christian, I think that million, that's real. A population of 20 million, you can then map, you can map, and I, you can map a theory about based on the actions of 40. Right, but that's just 40 people who came like out as trans. Like I just, no, no, I'm like saying, you said, we don't have the 40, data I'm to- saying, I'm saying, if you look at the, just the, the raw numbers on the amount of trans deaths per year, the vast majority of them, you can't, 100% of them are not black, number one. Right. Number two, what? if you look at the amount of what? trans deaths, we don't- How is that That's not even true though? Actually, no, it's not. I'm saying, I'm saying if you look at 100%, 100% of, of the trans people who die per year are not black. Uh, a large majority are. Okay, 100% of the population are not black. So then to say that, that black cis people versus black trans people, there's some, discrim some level of a violent proclivity towards one group or the other doesn't make sense. You don't, even have a, you don't even have a big enough sample size to make that kind of judgment. Wait, so if we can agree that we can't like necessarily pinpoint um, like the death rate, as, not, not sorry, death rate, but like the attack rate based on others. Can we agree based on the like universal fact that black trans people do have a lower life expectancy in comparison to like black men and black women? Like if, cause we did use life expect expectancy as a reference. That's point. also not true. Uh, Where is your data? Black the most vul I mean, we, the most vulnerable group in America is black men. But Period. I, That's I, true. But it depends what, it depends think, on how you compare the context. What's the, I think it depends what's, on the angle you're using at. Because if you're looking right. at society through the lens of like patriarchy, the patriarchy and sexism, then you're going to have to look at black women experiencing both forms of sexism and racism. And the truth is, you, like I do understand the statistical points, but black men do at some point, not the same privilege as white male privilege, but black men do experience like male pri pri privileges through just existing through society. So I think- Why is that true? Cis hetero. Black men on that. Yeah. I'm just, head, if you look at the if okay, you, all right, okay, everyone. Uh, so let Chris, 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 that the Chris, minority were black women. Chris Randall. All right, let's everybody take a second. So as usual in most debates, everybody agrees more than it seems that you all actually disagree. Right? We can all agree, right? That what? Based on the pot, we can all agree based on the population, right, of trans people in America, that the percentage of their deaths are very high, right? If we're going based on data, we can all say that it is high based on the number. Yeah. We can also all agree that because many of those deaths occur, right, that doesn't mean that black men are automatically somehow more violent to this particular group. But we can say that too many trans people die based on their representation in the general population. So what one side is saying is that trans people die very early. And we can say that that is bad. We can say that a high percentage of trans people die based on murder. We can also say that is bad. What Chris is trying to say that that does not automatically mean that black men automatically become somehow violent. Uh, yeah, so Gabrielle is saying that is not the fault of black men. And so you all, everyone is kind of agreeing more than they're disagreeing. 
And so the question really is, how should we think about the numbers in context of trans people, given that one, we don't have a lot of data, and two, how can we evaluate that data without demonizing a specific population? Here, here's the problem. So I don't, I guess I kind of lost the last argument y'all were having. Um, because I don't, I don't get what the purpose is. If the question is, are trans people vulnerable to things like homelessness, discrimination, et cetera? Yeah. If the argument, which was, the, I don't know who said it last, that cis black men have privilege, and I guess that entails that they're bound to other groups, well, that's, that's just manifestly false. So it's, you have to, you have to do things based in context, right? And this is what I was trying to explain when you, when I was giving the presentation. That stuff flies if you're just talking to people who agree with your ideology. Because people be like, oh yeah, you're a man, so you have male privilege. If you're a feminist, you're probably gonna agree with that. But if you have to prove it, you're not gonna have any data. So the question is, are you making arguments based on the assumption that the only people you have to talk to are people who basically agree with you? And if that's your assumption, that's fine. But if you but if you have to do stuff like prove your point which is what we have to do as scholars, then you're on very thin ground, which is why there are practically no studies showing that black men have privilege. There's just the kind of popular ideology, right? Um, if your argument is true, this is what's really interesting. So then you would have to say that trans men also have male privilege. So do trans men in a patriarchal racial society then become oppressors of other trans people, like trans women? I mean, are you asking? Are you yeah. asking? Oh, wait, I have a question then, because, like, I guess I, like, I think we're just all, like, coming from, like, the kind of just things that we've learned through society, like, you're talking about the fact as just, like, feminists and just, um, I guess, advocates for that, but I know, for example, like, in the Caribbean, um, like, homophobia is very, like, indebted in our culture, like, it's just, sure. like, for example, it's illegal to be gay in Jamaica, which is a, Absolutely. a mainly black-dominated, like, area, you know, so then yeah. can't you make the kind of, like, connection between that as a, a good amount of black men in that population are homophobic and could be in Jamaica. Yes. In Jamaica. Of, Absolutely. Okay. Good. Okay, this, okay. This is, listen, people, again, this is what I'm trying to say. I'm saying if you want to say in Jamaica, this is the case and you have data, for, God bless you. But if you're, but that's not what people have been saying. Y'all you're trying to make these identity arguments about cis people versus trans people. And what I'm telling you is you don't have enough data to say because you're not interviewing the perpetrators or the killers. So until you start doing that, you don't know what the motivations are. You don't know if the perpetrators are trans or cis. You, you have nothing to go on besides this kind of stereotype you're trying to make about largely cis men because cis men are, cis black men are the ones that commit homicide in the society. And notice how far this goes, right? What I'm trying to warn you of is like, if I accept your premise, notice what I could do with it. I can do the same thing for black women. Black women are bad mothers because they kill more children per capita than white women do in, in certain situations. Black women are more abusive. Black women are, you know, I can take any negative stereotype about a small population of the group and then totalize it to the whole group. But it's not a stereotype though. It's like a systemic, like first, I just want to make it clear that not I wasn't trying systemic. to make a claim. Like I, I was like trying to make a, like I wasn't trying to make a claim. I was just asking a question because this, like the idea that like black men don't like, have a certain capacity i wasn't aware of and so i was just questioning no, i didn't say that they do have a capacity means. to kill no y'all are mixing things because of your politics black men like anybody I don't else have any politics no no i'm not talking i'm not picking on you miss jennings i'm just saying in general i'm not picking on you Ms. Jennings. what i'm saying is black men can kill people black women can kill people people can kill people okay Nothing I've said has anything to do with the capacities of individuals to do harm to other individuals. Okay. All I am saying is if you're going to make a general theory, like if I say white people are racist and someone okay. says, well, what's your claim for that? So I know some individual white people who are not racist. And I say, as a group, white people generally vote for racist policies. My, you see what I'm saying? It's contextual. If you try to do the same thing with cis black men or cis black people, what sort of evidence will you present besides of the th 25 of the 30 trans people killed were killed by cis people? Hence, I think that cis people generally kill, right? Like, you, you Wait, can't, you but know. also, 
can, can we take a moment to acknowledge that social science does not even really acknowledge the fact that trans people exist. So the ability for data to exist to analyze the deaths and murders of trans people is already hindered. So the continual sort of yeah. begging for data and studies when the studies don't even think about those people. And we've already framed, reframed this question to be about cis people versus trans people, not black cis men, because we agree that the, the assumption about black cis men is everything that you've said about black studies, but we're making a different claim about cis people, right. and trans people. But here's right. And, and so even if we go to that level, I'm not saying that you have to have absolute data to tell you whether or not it's true or false. I'm saying that you can't make it generalizable. That's so my then, point. But what does that mean about the general public's idea of transphobia? Should it just like not exist because there's no, no data? Focus on the focus on the discrimination, right? Like what I'm, this is what I'm saying. There is a tendency in our culture to look at a perpetrator model that every, every time we talk about oppression and discrimination, somebody's a perpetrator and has to be held individually accountable, right? Mm -hmm. When we talk about domestic violence, oh, it's the, all these, these, these sexist men. When we talk about this, it's all, right? That's all you're doing. You're looking for perpetrators. If the question is, are transgender people more likely to be victims of discrimination, homelessness? We have data on that. We have their stories. We know that's true, right? But that doesn't seem to be the question that we're asking. We're asking something greater than that. And that's what I'm saying that we can't generalize to, right? If you wanna, if you wanna run cases or wanna run on save trans people, save, you know, equalize X, Y, Z, homelessness, healthcare, God bless you, because all that matters. If you're trying to create an antagonism between cis and trans based on violence, I think that's a harder generalizable fact to prove. But in this political climate, you probably could do that too. If I could, mean? if I could also just point out, so um, I think so. What Dr. Curry is saying is that you can have some data, right, that starts to provisionally prove a claim or move in a direction, right, but that you can't come to right a full conclusion. Exactly. So even during his his presentation, right, he said, "Well, here's some data that you know is is based on correlation, not causation. It starts to move in a direction, right." He he explains that there's a weakness, right to the argument because we don't have a full set of data. You can still talk about correlations, you can still talk about things that happen to people, right? And all these things can still be bad without saying that there's a cause, a causal relationship between one group of people and another. Yes. Every every set of data has a transphobia plays in the death of trans people it's not just out of nowhere sometimes people use defenses such as i thought that person was x gender and when they revealed they were not i killed them because that was Absolutely. the justification but i'm not violence. i'm not denying that I'm, I'm, how do you say your last name miss bayes bias bias miss bias i'm not denying that at all all i'm saying is is just like the problem you have with domestic violence for 30 years people thought it was sexism right? That sexism causes domestic violence. For the last 30 years, all the evidence says something different. It's previous trauma, conflict, right? Like, we have all sorts of racism. Most white Americans have some form of implicit bias and anti-blackness, but it doesn't mean causally that every person that has anti-blackness or implicit bias is going to go kill a black person. And that's all I'm, I'm literally making the same claim. It's very true that transphobia may be a necessary condition for the murder of trans peoples but it's not a sufficient claim, right? That only in the sense that if we have transphobia, it will lead to the murder of trans people. You see what I'm saying? Will you say the last part again? It's not a sufficient uh, claim, meaning that um, I, it's, transphobia is not the only thing necessary to make someone kill a trans person. Okay, I see what you're saying. Right, and that's the only point that I'm trying to make because I have responsibility to be, right, I have to limit Nothing's absolutely true, but I have to limit and tell you what, what causes things or what correlates to things, right? And all I'm trying to say is the way that we debate identity, especially in the debate topics now, do not have any backing. And in some cases, right, they're merely just stereotypes of the group that you want to hold to be the perpetrator. Because I do know that there are lots of conversations going on in social media that's trying to push this narrative about Black men, about straight Black men, right, or cis black men, right? And there's no evidence for that, right? So we have to be careful that us trying to liberate our fight for a group doesn't lead to the demonization of another group, right? The same way that I can say white women overwhelmingly are racist, right? But white women on general 
in general don't lead to, don't cause homicide. You know, and when I talk about homicides, homicides of cis men are usually other cis men. So you know, like overwhelmingly, you know. So this is what I mean. Like we have to we have to know something about what we're talking about. It's not a question of denying. We we think binary. Oh well, if you're not saying transphobia is this, then you're denying that. No. Clearly, trans people are killed at a higher proportion than, than many groups, right? Does not mean, however, that transphobia or transphobia of cis men are the primary mechanism by which that homicide happened. I have homicide. a question. Sorry, just like this is out of just genuine like curiosity. Oh, sure. uh, so, like, I guess how would the research, like, talking about the fact that, like, once again, that it claims that like black men are at the bottom of society. And I'm just like wondering, how does this play into like um, colorism experienced on black women coming from black men? Or is that just something that we kind of just think in our heads and have an assumption that everyone operates on? No, but, there, but there's been colorism. Again, this is why I'm always interested about the question. Yes, do black women experience colorism by black men? Yeah, because many black men are heterosexual, so they choose women based on what they think are pretty. Um, and in some instances, mostly in the North, um, but sometimes, I guess some regions of the South, given the data, like black men find lighter skin attractive. But guess what? Black women also find lighter skin attractive, right? And people who are educated in, in, amongst black people find lighter skin attractive. And educated in more middle class, what black women find lighter skin attractive, right? Like there's, this is what I mean, there, that there's so many conflicting and, and complex things to account for is not just a general rule. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand it. I got you. Yeah, and, and look, that's what this is what I mean, right? The difference between the difference between talking to a professor on these issues versus someone else is that professors generally, right, when they're if they're good, <laughs> um, generally know that there's always something that complicates what you're saying. Right? So I can say at a general level that black men are pushed, you know, suffer more disadvantages compared to their female counterpart. But that doesn't mean that black women have privilege. Because the only group that black women could be privileged to would be a certain class of black men, which is largely be poor black men, right? So you have to you. So when you say things like, um, I don't I don't know who said it because it kind of came out. But if you say things like just on the virtue of being male, there's male privilege. Then how do you explain white women having more privilege than practically every group of racialized men in the world? Right? Like it's just part of our ideology that we say, oh, that's all because of race. So that means that Asian men. Um, Jewish, right? Like just every race has the same relationship with white women because of race. That doesn't make sense, right? Like it's just what we're choosing because that's what our ideology mandates. It's not objectively true in any sense. And what I guess I'm trying to push on you is that part of the thing about being a good debater isn't just going with the dominant ideology. You're like preaching to the choir. You're trying to out-victimize the other victims, right? When you could actually be having fruitful debates about how really nuanced and complicated dynamics in society operate, right? And that's, that's what I'm pushing, right? I'm pushing that if you actually know other theories besides intersectionality, which has no evidence and keeps contradicting itself in the empirical literature, right? That maybe you wanna think about something differently, just maybe, right? And I'm just giving you the tools to do that. You don't have to absolutely believe it. It's just trying to get your engines going so that you can think about other things. Mr. Brunus Holes? Yeah, uh, Brunus Schultz, it's weird, but yeah. Uh, I was wondering how social dominance theory understands like disability and ableism. Does it see it as just like an arbitrary set type of discrimination? Yes, it, absolutely, it could be, it could be. It the, feels like the intent is less like to slaughter and it's more paternalistic. Just like, yeah, I, I guess I don't really have evidence for that, but it just feels that way to me. No, but I, I think that but the, it's funny because the research on disability shows that it depends on the race. So there is a paternalistic aspect to white races and an exterminatory aspect, uh, especially to disabled black men, right? So I, I suppose it's contextual, but there is literature on disability. I actually wrote an article and I have another one that's due um, on social dominance and disability uh, on, a subordinate, on a subordinate male groups. So there is some evidence, but again, you know, it's one of those things is it because they're they're disabled or is it because they're they're subordinate men? You know, I, you, you don't you just don't know. Right? Mm -hmm. You just don't know. Other questions?
Uh, I have a question regarding like the power uh, white women have when it's compare in comparison to like racialized men. So, okay. uh, so besides like white women having more money, uh, what are like is white women having more power? Another reason why so many like black innocent unarmed black men also die. Yeah, that's what McConnell said. Yes. But white women have tremendous amounts of power. Like they have tremendous political power. They're the second richest group in America. They hold the majority of the wealth of the white household because they inherit it all. I mean, that's a lot of power. Okay. So I have a question. So would you say that black people are discriminated against not because they are inherently black or that arbitrary set, because of, uh, but because of like a patriarchal system where the competition uh, to please women and gain resources is the reason for that violence against black men. That would be, I think Zidanius would say that. Um, I, I tend to think that racism functions to eliminate competing groups, right? So here's, what year were y'all born? Oh, three. Damn. Okay. So you don't even have it. You don't, you, you old, old as hell, Tom. You old as hell, Tom. Yeah. You old as hell. I, I am getting old as hell. All right. So check this out. I'm 40 years old. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1979. So I was born at the end of segregation. So my view of racism is that it's a managerial strategy that keeps one group away from the other group. Right. right? And my, my, my evidence for that is like when you look at any colonial society, that's exactly what they did. So what's your view of racism? Well, I'm trying to contextualize to the re reading. I think racism is based on like a racial dynamic, just like white people thinking that their race is somehow superior to like other races. Not okay, because of- But, but, is it all, but does racism only affect white people? No, it affects like all groups of like racist because they can have racism between black and Asians, Asians okay. and whites and stuff like that. But I didn't think of that racism to be kind of like, to be caused by like a patriarchal system based on what this reading, well, I think this yeah. reading says. So I'm but trying to see- Pretty much every like, racist society is a patriarchal society. Right, but there is a difference, like the reading says, between a patriarchy and mm -hmm. an arbitrary set. So, if but there's remember, if there's a difference, wait. But I just want to make this clear real quick. Remember, there is a difference, but all the societies are already patriarchal and capitalistic. See what I'm saying? Oh. So arbitrary set discrimination and patriarchy exist in capitalist Western patriarchal society. Right. So but, that means that these dynamics are already in the society and they operate on groups differently. Okay. So when the uh, when the reading analyzed the differences between patriarchy and arbitrary set being that patriarchy um they have a code determinants like men and women are dependent on each other but arbitrary set systems are not yes so how would that explain like racism in between like different races that isn't tied to like patriarchy because it says like well, europeans every... aren't dependent on black people but no, but Europeans are dependent on, on women. So that means that they're going right. to do the same thing to Asian men. So like, so like in the work that I, the, the research I do, they constructed Asian men as rapists too. And they killed them for trying to, so they could, they passed anti-miscegenation laws. They did the same thing to indigenous men. They do the same thing to Muslim men. Like what I'm saying is that historically, the dynamic of racism, anti-black racism, anti, you know, Asian racism, isolationism, et cetera, is to make sure that our group men don't reproduce and mess up the racial stock of the dominant group. So if I were to make a debate argument like against Afro-pessimism, I can say yeah. the root cause of like anti-black violence is not white to black, but patriarchy. Or but you, the, the stronger argument would be Afro-pessimism erases uh, the ability of us to disaggregate the kinds of racial violence that is talking about from men and women. So basically, Afro pessimism says that black violence is genocidal, when in fact history shows that black vi that racist violence towards black men is genocidal. So a social dominance frame would give you a better articulation of how violence actually functions in the society. Okay. 
Because there's not a, there's not a, there's, besides from maternal death, there's not going to be any kind of violence that uniquely affects women, black women more than black men. Right? But in terms of political and structural violence, right? Like incarceration, poverty, homelessness, right? Those are, those are overwhelmingly male majority kinds of violence across the okay. board. And that leads me to a second question, uh, which is much quicker. So how is the theory of like double jeopardy disproved on like a psychological level? I, I already have a day what you say, but like, um, I mean, the studies dismiss like those subjective forms of dis discrimination. Yeah, it does. Right. It, but, it, you go ahead. but like, could that be like substantiated though? Like, those subjective forms of discrimination can be true. And they can, but I mean, I th this is the this is the problem, right? Like, if you if social dominance theory is very clear that it's not interested in subjective accounts, it's interested in you know what certain people and populations say report. So again, it's an empirical theory that's trying to explain material things. If you say, "Well, I care about subjective stories and anecdotes," then that's all good, but that's when you're going to get into this argument about whose experience matters more. Right? Right, I see. So if you if a black woman says if, if I'm in a debate round with a black woman, she's like, well, I'm more oppressed because my race is sex. Then a black man comes in, it's like, well, racism affects me differently. And it's a misandric aggression or it targets me. And then people in the room say, well, I don't believe that because I only know intersectionality. And what he his experience, what he's saying in his experience is actually objectively true. But based on what people know and politically connect with, they say it's false. Right. So, I mean. This is, this whole thing about like anecdote and subjective is important, but it's important when it's contextualized. Because I can tell the story of a poor white man who's more oppressed than black people, right? And would y'all vote for that in a round? Would judges vote for that? Some probably would. But I I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if they would, but most likely no. Okay, so here's my question. But that white man's probably telling the truth. Because a poor white man has worse life chances and life expectancy and social mobility than practically all forms of educated women in society. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, he's I more likely to be shot by the cops. He's more likely to be incarcerated. He's less likely to, he could be racist. He's probably conservative too, right? But in terms of what he's saying, it's objectively true. But nobody would vote for that poor white man. Not because it's false, but because you don't have any empathy for poor white men. Because your political ideology says poor white men still have white male privilege. And this is what I mean. You can do that to any group. You're doing that to each other. You're just saying, okay, well, I think black women are more oppressed, despite all the data that says otherwise. I think gay white people are oppressed, despite all the data that says otherwise. And then you motivate, you mobilize that as a political argument saying subjective experience matters. No, you've already decided which group you think is oppressed, so you exclude all evidence and just say, I vote for my political preference. That's fine if you want to do that, but you understand that there are certain areas in life where that can't work, right? Yeah. So, like, if you, if you come, if you stand up into any kind of field that's interdisciplinary, where they expect, where, and you're actually judged on whether you're correct, then if somebody comes up and just reads Chetty, then you're going to look like an idiot, because they're going to say, look, Here's, here's what you say politically. Here's what every single piece of data for the last 30 years says. It's not compatible. You can feel how you want to feel about the world, but you have to prove something too. So all those alt-right men feel that they're the more, most oppressed. They objectively have data that shows that, that some of their numbers actually oppress racial, uh, approach racial minorities, right? But politically, they're not in right now because they're racist. All right, that makes sense. Yeah, Wait, listen, people. Unpack? I'm sorry. Who, I, was just, I was gonna ask if you could unpack the like poor white men are more oppressed in terms of like compared to who like other racial minorities. Um, so if you look at life expectancy, like it depends on the measure. If you look at life expectancy, uh, incarceration rates, etc. Right, poor white men are certainly more incarcerated than black women. Right. Wait, but so we don't got. Sorry, but. but but not black men. Char Mr. Charwright? Yeah, uh, Sharid, sorry. Sharid. Um, but that wouldn't really fit in terms of population, right? Because the majority of people in America are white. Absolutely. 
But if I control for class, class. then it would. Okay. So if I say all white people, then you're right, small population. If I control for socioeconomic status to say poor white men, then it would fit within that. Okay. See what I'm saying? And that's what, this is what I'm trying to explain to y'all. You're making, I'm not saying you uh, specifically, sir, but I'm saying in general, do you see how all of your claims have to be nuanced, right? You see yeah. how you see how it completely shifts when I start. So if I start talking about educated black women and you're telling me they're impressed, uh, oppressed, I'm gonna laugh at you because they make more sometimes than white women, right? It depends specifically on the group you're talking about. So unless you're going to go in with a, a claim that's empirically verifiable, you just basically have to make generalizations and hope that it fits with the political sentiment of the of the people judging you. Okay. And that's why I'm saying that these grandiose gestures of oppression, um, of who's oppressed and who's getting killed, these things matter because you're talking about populations and actual people dying. So there are conditions, like most of the people, most of the trans people that get killed are poor people, right? Most of the women that are abused in this country are poor women. They're not just women. There's very, there's very little pattern, rep rep ah, repeated or repetitive patterns of domestic abuse in the upper in the upper classes of the United States. Overwhelmingly, the majority of domestic abuse happens amongst poor people, especially amongst the black race. It's poor black people, poor brown people. People are in and out of jail, right? So if you're serious about solving these kinds of issues, then you should know the people and the group of people that you're actually talking about. And that's all I'm saying. Your evidence and your solutions have to be tailored to the problem that you're trying to confront. Right? Other questions? Um, I, sorry, you can go ahead. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, oh. Uh, okay. Okay. Ms. Connor and then. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks. Oh, yeah. Also, first of all, um, thanks so much for doing these lectures. Um, like, I know I've been learning a lot. I think we've all been learning a lot, but like. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. Really grateful that you're taking the time to do this. But um, I, yeah, I actually it's... enjoy it. So. That's good. Uh, I guess in, uh, or my question was, um, you showed us like several graphs and then there was one graph related to uh, shooting, I think, where like black men were hurt way more um, than any other group. But then there mm -hmm. was a second graph where they were also shown to like earn way more money than women in the workplace. And then I thought about this as being like an example of sort of like a direct versus indirect situation um, mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, different scenarios, but why wouldn't the wage gap be an example of like a direct scenario insofar as um, like white men control employment and wages. Oh, they do. I, black men are the ones who are disadvantaged in the wage gap because they're pushed down towards female uh, earnings. Yes, but like what explains the fact that they like still earn more than like white women in some cases? Or like, like in the does? Yeah, yeah. Oh, because, so that's, hold on, I'll go back to it really quickly. I think I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the Sedanius one, right? I have a screenshot of it, so I could just send the graph in the chat. Yeah, but I'm, pre I'm pretty sure I know what you're talking about. Are you talking about graph number four, figure four, or figure three? Um, okay, wait, I have to find it. It's on my desktop. Um, uh, figure three. Yeah. So... The difference between that graph is where they're meeting in 2010 in terms of weekly earnings and the occupation, okay? So if I gave you, are you still there? Hello? Hello, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. All right, so if you look at that graph, you see his weekly earnings from 1970 to 2010, right? And you see in 2010 that the weekly earnings are converging, right? Those are just averages of earnings. But if I told, if I separated those earnings based on occupation and showed you the actual numbers and hours work, it looks very different. So most black men work in blue collar jobs because they don't finish college. And they tend to work an average of 10, five to 10 hours more than their female counterparts. So that explains some of that gap, right? In the 1970s, there was more labor participation. So black men were working more in the economy than white women did, which is why back if you look at the data for 70s, black men are earning more per week. And that's what was a big, a big emphasis for the feminist argument, because they were saying, oh, look, black men earn more than women. By 1985, that had completely switched. Because by 1985, black women outnumber black men as students and teachers in most, in most different factors. So that meant that when the economy started modernizing, 
and black men didn't have degrees, they got pushed down. And that's why you see that steady decrease of their earnings compared to their white female counterpart and their female counterpart. The other problem is there's a selection bias in this. Because in the 1980s, there's also an expansion of the prison industrial complex, and they start pulling more black men out of society. So a lot of the sociologists now look at what happens, like the role that incarceration has. And if you take incarceration of the groups into effect, black men get pushed five to 10 cents lower than their black female counterparts. So there's lots of different variables that explain that. Sedanius uses those charts because he's trying to show that there's a huge gap between male and male earning versus female and female earning. Well, that, that proves his argument, right? But if you're looking at it like to find out which groups are actually making more and what kind of jobs they're working, then it would look a little bit different. And I can send you those charts if you want. All about data. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. So I have two questions. Yes, sir. Um, first, so according to the reading, arbitrary set systems are only like male versus male aggression. Um, I was wondering if there were instances in which arbitrary set uh, set systems could also be like female versus female aggression or something like that. There's there's an argument by um, a, a Dr. McDonald who shows that there is female aggression against outgroup men, but there there are no dominant or repetitive documented cases of female to in-group female to outgroup female aggression, at least things like homicide, right? Um, there's some notice of death, death by proxy, which is like the white woman calling the police in the park, Amy Cooper, right, to get a police to shoot a black man. Um, those types of things happen. Uh, historically, white women have organized lynchings of black men. They've cut off black male genitalia. They've done those types of things, but we don't have many reported cases of them doing that to black women beyond, you know, I mean, what we, we do, I mean, they haven't lynched any black women that I know of. But they have, uh, there is one reported case of them cutting like a baby out of a black woman's stomach, but and have been president. But yeah, it's not the not the same kind of recorded cases, right? In my personal opinion, I think white women are incredibly violent, right? Like everything that we see in terms of uh, their child abuse numbers, their numbers of intimate partner violence suggests that they are individually violent. But most women don't commit homicide at that at the same rate, so it's difficult to kind of track that. Okay. So what's your second question? Yeah, so my second question was, uh, is benevolent sexism like sort of biopolitical? Yes. It would, it would be the, literally a definition of Foucault's biology. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, but see, this is, that's, that's great that you made that connection because if you, here's what's funny about this, is that I know this is a new theory that you're trying to get your head around, but I could literally show you a text written in 1892 it makes the exact same argument by a white feminist, right? Because this is what I mean. Like white women knew that the reason they wouldn't be treated like racial minorities is because white men needed them to reproduce. So they're never going to be expendable that way, right? The reason that you have white women winning in a patriarchal society as a group is because of that factor, right? So given that, until you deal with white women, you're not gonna deal with racism, white supremacy. Because you can, think about it, you can attack white men all you want. And how, how have white men historically responded to attacks? They victimize themselves. They victimize back. themselves, but what, else, but what do white men have that no other group has? Capacity? Like political power? Huh? Like uh, political power? Exactly. You can criticize just think about it, people. You can criticize white men all day for being the worst people in the world. And they're like, okay. They still control the government. They still support, control the Supreme Court. They still support the economy. They still control corporations, right? And once you're in that, in that reality, where, I'm, I'm curious, where, when have the white women risen up against white men? When have they taken to the streets with guns and, and batons and marched on white men. Has it happened? Did I miss it? No answers? Never happened. Never yeah, happened. Right, so, 
so this is what I'm saying. Like you have to, I know what you're learning debate. What I'm asking you to do is just think. If the system is set up to reproduce certain forms of hierarchy, then why, why do these white women who claim they're just as oppressed as black women and brown men and all these other people not doing the same thing that they're doing? When Me Too popped off, they wore pink hats and didn't know a single person to get arrested. Black and brown people in the streets and people are getting killed. So somebody explain to me the difference. Right? And that's what I'm saying. Like, you can walk around with this kind of liberal ideology where we're all about coalitions and we want to recognize people. But the people you want to recognize aren't the people being killed and deported in this country. I could talk about trans people all day. If that's what you want to do, absolutely. But Trump didn't write laws about trans people not coming into the United States because he wanted to launch a war in, uh, against Muslims. He's not deporting. They're taking little babies from, from Mexico and South America. You see what I'm saying? Like the political apparatus of the system is disproportionately affects certain racialized groups more than some of the in-group politics that we constantly discuss and moralize. And you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. What I'm saying is that if you get your feet held to the fire by somebody who doesn't care about your political sympathies and say, well, then what are you doing about these kids that are still locked up, right? Now, evidently, the world just forgot about that, right? Who are being abused and raped within, you know, ICE detention centers. And they said, why is this not part of the focus? You're like, oh, well, that's kind of outside my political conversation. My bad. My liberal, my liberal debater manual only told me to care about Me Too, uh, Black Lives Matter, and, and trans issues. Right. Do you see how dishonest that is if you're really trying to understand how oppression within the geopolitical space actually works? Right. You have to um, expand how you think. So, uh, I, yeah, Miss Ajayi? Yeah, Ajayi. Yeah. I kind of have a question about like the social relations between like black men and black women. Because if you think, if you think about it, like if because if you because the conversations that we have is like and the way like we socially view oppression like black women will like make faces or like they'll think about it once if you tell them that like black women are not like them if um get statistically most like discriminated like compared to black women black men but mm -hmm. like based on like the double a double jeopardy it is like normalized that they are so yeah. if when um because like they have those type of reactions is could you like make a statement statement that um black women are like they want uh, it's kind of problematic but like they want to feel like that sort of inferiority so that they can assimilate into what white women have to feel oh absolutely like, there's evidence for that yeah yeah and, but how and does that like impact the relationship that they have with black men no, it's a class relationship like in the 1970s jet magazine essence wrote like a series of articles about how highly educated black women were attacking poor working class black men for the same arguments that we're having amongst ourselves today, right? And the whole issue is, is that educated middle-class black women want the same kind of mate selection that middle-class white women get, and they can't get it. So all those articles around associative mating um, are all about educated black women not having enough eligible black men. but lower class black women don't seem to have a problem getting men or, or having children. That's a middle class issue. So yeah. Uh, I have another question. Yes. So like, could it be said that black women, like their condition, well, they have like better education and things like that, while black men just before, like don't have access to that. But could the fact that like black women, like, pre like can give birth to like black men and like we have this like, we're like the libidinal desire to like destroy blackness and like specifically talking about how black men face more forms of material forms of violences that that black that black women need to be protected in order to create more black men that can be destroyed. That's exactly what Anna Cooper said. But yes, you could say that. Okay, what? Anna so Cooper's think of argument, that? huh? So yeah, what do you think of that? I'm trying to like, I think it's, like, you know, no, Anna, do, you have, Hannah, do you know who Anna Julia Cooper is? Okay, right. All right. You got back up a little bit, Doc. All right. Anna Julia Cooper was, um, she's claimed by feminists to be like this proto intersectional thinker. But in reality, she was a race woman. And her argument was that, look, we just got out of slavery. These white people are trying to kill us and they're trying to rape the women. 
So we need a race of really strong men to protect the women with their lives so that the women can give birth to more black men to raise up the race. So that's why she said the black woman's like the home. So you can make that argument, but that argument comes from a kind of ideology that does not fit with your liberal politics, right? Because it's, it's based on political necessity, right? If, if you have a group of people that are killing black men, right? The whole point, if the race wants to survive, is you need more men. So that's why women, so have you ever read about the Holocaust? Uh, like specifics about it? No. Okay, check this out. So the first thing that German women did when they wanted to exterminate the Jews was to go back into the home. Because the idea was, if we're going to overthrow Jews, we need more Germans. We need strong German families to reproduce ourselves because we're going to war. So you ever notice how, like, when people go to war, like, men usually get the women pregnant before they leave? Like, why do you think they do that? In case they die, they're like family and right. lineage to continue. Exactly, because in, in modern society for the last three or four centuries, wars, well, probably since antiquity, wars disproportionately kill men, right? Because they're the ones fighting. So it depends your frame. If you think that racism is a war, then it makes sense to say that the responsibility of race women are to have more babies so we can keep fighting the war. If you think that racism is based in discrimination, then you'll be like an intersexual feminist and say that men saying women should have babies for the race is patriarchy. But there's not an example from antiquity to now where women who are on the dominant side of the fight don't have more babies to win the war. Like, that's what I mean. You kind of got a reality check here. Is it oppressive in a liberal sense? Absolutely. In a nationalist sense, absolutely not. But most people today think of themselves as modern liberal cosmopolitan people, so they think it's offensive. But in terms of how war is actually conducted within an actual society, there hasn't been an example that I know otherwise. But I'm not saying that, that black women should do that. I'm just saying that those arguments have been made before. David, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So like my question was just, it's like, um, all right, so you're critique, you so say like you're criticizing like the, like the standard, is it like the, you're criticizing like the standard view of intersectionality and like yes. you're, which is in a, so like is the one, is the view that you're using, is that called STD? I mean, STD. Yeah, it's the Danish view. I mean, I'm sympathetic to it, but my, my work differs a little bit. Uh, so like, is there, is there like a name, like um, whatever, like what argument like you're trying to talk about? Well, I'm a black most studies scholar. So like we have different arguments, like, okay. Racism is misandric. Black men have sexual vulnerability. Um, racism is a genocidal or gendercidal logic. Yeah, I mean, we very it, it 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 correlates, but it differs in some aspects. Like Sedanius doesn't look at the rape of men because he thinks that it's ra it's rare, but the the historical archives we have does not show that. It shows that racialization produces sexual vulnerability very similar to what we see in women, female groups. So, yeah. It's, 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 it's just an, it's an academic debate. Okay. So do you think, so do you think like the, um, like the argument that, that like you've been like uh, lecturing about, like, where do you, like, where do you think that can like apply in like a debate setting? Like, would you, would you like argue this against like um, identity case or? Yeah. I'd, like if I was, if I had a debate on identity case, I would run it against that. I run it against feminist cases. If there's arguments about intersectional visibility, um, saying that you know certain groups of uh, women or non-binary people are should be centered in police killing or incarceration, it's a great critique to run. Uh, you can run it as a case if you're doing criminal justice. I mean, there's a lot of applications to it. I mean, you can run it as a critique to like liberalism or to any value theory, because the argument is that a society is always going to be permanently racist, right? It just shows you the steps of, of why and how. A lot of different applications for the argument. How would it function as a affirmative on the criminal justice topic? Um, police killing by rape, black men, indigenous men and brown men by far killed than any other race, sex, 
group, um, traditional theories of democracy don't work because they don't understand that gender oppression specifically targets subordinate males. You can put the cards that we've just been talking about there. There's a great argument, like when I do the Black Male Studies Police Lecture, there's all kind of arguments talking about Black men are like 20 times more likely to be killed than practically any other group by <laughs> in terms of order of magnitude. Um, social dominance theory is the best way to solve uh, because it gives a diagnosis of how patriarchy functions in real time. Uh, intersectionality makes X claim, but it's empirically false. Uh, intersectional visibility says that we can explain this through androcentrism, but that's only a genocidal logic because you could kill 100,000 black men and they would still say the group has privilege. Uh, yeah, and nobody else in the status quo is even close to understanding the problem. I mean, you got lots, if that's, if that's the way you want to go. Because notice this social dominance works really good if you're trying to pinpoint an empirical situation and solve it or, or diagnose it correctly, right? So if you pick anything practically, like you could even pick the wage gap. Like the wage gap, I think it, I always thought this would be great if somebody did this. So if somebody started talking about like sexism with like white women and you just show them the wage gap where black men generally make less and then you introduce incarceration and show them the adjusted wages and say like the whole thing in debates a lie. Like everything we're arguing about is a lie. This is the only way to solve. It's not just about solving the problem, is that you don't even, you can't even get the facts right, right? I mean, I just think that'll be an awesome way to win around. Because you can't, this is the difference. You can, like, we can go back and forth in the debate around about what people believe. But when you start pulling out all the cards and say, look, here's all, here, this evidence says this, this evidence says this, this evidence says this. These are the values that we need to talk about because, like, black men are, and brown men and indigenous men are falling out of society, literally falling out of civil society. Right? What, what's Afro pessimism going to say? Oh, well, we think you have to be Afro pessimistic. You're like, no, we don't, because you mistakenly think that all black people are being killed at the same rate. And all our evidence shows that it specifically targets these groups of men. So you can't get anywhere with your theory because you think it's a race question. And we're saying that it's a race gender question. You just, you can't solve. Right? So, no, there's a lot of, there's a lot of applications for this stuff. Right? I just, I think that the effect of it is, is that it requires actual debating, right? Actually debating the claims, right? You could actually run it, even if you're like, if you want to do like black women, it would be, a, this would be a sweet way to answer like uh, intersectional feminism back. Because your argument would be that black women, uh, because they're black and female, don't get the benefits of um, benevolent patriarchy, benevolent sex is the way that white people do. So the argument, so you can run a case of benign neglect. That the whole point is because patriarch is a structure that tries to eliminate men and protect white women and white and black women fall out of are, are basically left to their own devices. They're neglected so they don't have protection and all the men are being killed. So they're a vulnerable population that can get none of the benefits of white women, even though they're not exterminated the same way. Right, you could, yeah, there's tons of, it's, it's, a, it's a grand theory. So you can use it for whatever you want, right? You just have to understand the, the, the implications of it. And when somebody writes intersectionality against you and say, oh, well, we should consider black women, be like, no, because you don't understand that the reason that black women keep falling behind is because they're completely decimating the men. Like intersectionality can't solve that. Social dominance theory can't. Because we talk about this as a, as a byproduct of this overarching dynamic. Intersectionality wants to ignore that. So you get a net benefit on solvency for that. All right? Other questions? All right. Wait, let's see. Okay. Yeah. So, is there anything else? Right. I have a general question. This is kind of unrelated to the reading. Yes. Kind of. So, like, are you an undergraduate or professor at a uh, undergraduate professor at Edinburgh or professor in graduate school or any type of professor there? So, uh, I am. I am. What is? Um, I'm, I'm what in America would be like a distinguished professor. 
So I teach graduate and undergraduate students, just like I did in the United States. Okay. But in, in Europe, their grad courses are special. So, um, you know, they, like you have to apply to grants. You have to be, you have to, it's really competitive to get a PhD in Europe not like the United States. So I have less grad students here than I did in the United States. Okay. Other questions? Are we good? All right. Thank you. Oh, well, I see two new messages. Hold on. It's a Tupac of Europe. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. No, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Uh, and like I said, on the trans issues, people, if y'all want, if y'all want to run cases like that, um, there's more stuff coming out. Um, you know, there there are certainly a vulnerable population. Uh, it just it just really it's just really a question of how you want to account for transphobia, right? So we'll, we could talk about that more when we do the Black Male Studies lecture. So thank you. Thank you.